Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. We are live from Leap Deep Fest, the incredible conference in Riyadh on the second day, February 10th, 2025. I'm here with Ariel Wolana, founder, managing director of Finster Experts. Ariel, welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Thanks, Sanjay. I've listened to a number of your episodes. It's great to be a part of it. Absolutely. Ariel, we have a global audience of policymakers, business leaders, uh, think tank experts. Just can you briefly tell them a little bit about what uh, FinServe Experts do, does? Yeah, we are a tiny, uh, and by tiny, I mean tiny, we're 18 people, uh, for a consultancy focused on emerging technology, combination of business and technology leaders. All of us have held C-level positions at some point in our career. Our focus is on how to bring to life business models that would be impossible without emerging tech. Uh, every time a, a new technology comes along, blockchain, quantum computing, AI, all the way back to the internet or mobile phones, um, the same thing happens, which is that these technologies emerge, they show a lot of promise, and then um, companies will spend tens of millions of dollars implementing them, re-engineer their existing business model, and then they're surprised when they get no value. So we focus on the new business models that wouldn't be possible that are enabled by the newest technology. And right now that means AI and quantum computing. So you raised some very important questions, Ariel. Do you think um, that there is a ROI for these AI investments these companies are making? Uh, as with blockchain, as with robotics, as with IoT, Yes, tremendously, but that ROI will be received probably by less than 10% of the companies that invest in it. So 90% are basically doing it on hope and a prayer? Well, and and that's actually, I think 90%, you know, uh, I, you know the last number I heard, 90%, 94% of startups fail. 90% is actually good okay. by, by historical measures. Now, when you deal with these companies, Ariel, is there a push coming in from the board, the CEOs, that we need to be AI-enabled, AI-first? Uh, what is the reason why companies are moving so fast to artificial intelligence? I would say there's no one reason. There is certainly a push, uh, and it, there is, it is absolutely the case that some people are doing AI because their board tells them to or because they believe, sometimes wrongly, sometimes quite rightly, that by branding themselves with AI, it's a better way to get investment. However, uh, you know, on the on, on the opposite side, there are a bunch of technologists who see the amazing potential uh, and create solutions looking for problems. Um, you have to start with the business model, the business case. What are you going to change? What are you going to do now that people couldn't do? If you look at uh, you know the the famous disruptors, Amazon, Uber, mm -hmm. Airbnb, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, like the thing that they did innovative wasn't the tech it was the new business model delivering things cars mm -hmm. on demand uh mm -hmm. hotel you know basically you're using uh spare spare room space as a hotel it was the business model that was the innovation that changed things not the tech it's going to be no different with ai or with quantum so ariel if i'm uh understanding you clearly that if a traditional company, a Fortune 500 traditional company is looking at implementing or becoming AI enabled, the term that a lot of companies are using, they need to really change their business model or re-engineering, true? Uh, well, for a, a large established company, it might not be their business model, it might be their operating model, how they provide a capability, even what is traditionally, you know, might be a cost center. So, but it, but again, it, it's, you can't just re-engineer re the, you know, same as with a business model. You can't just re-engineer the existing operating model. You're going to have to do something different that actually takes advantage of the capability that AI is delivering. If you just try to use it to replace jobs, um, it's not going to work. You have to think about what is the new operating model that it enables? How can I, you know, my employees that, you know, that I'm not firing, that I'm keeping, how can I get them to, to do much my, more, high value add, much more customer touch, customer facing uh, mm -hmm. activities. If you don't do that, it's probably not gonna go anywhere. So what you're saying is a new operating model that needs to be engaged. Do you believe that there is a important role for change management in these companies because of this? Uh, yes, 
Um, but again, you know, I, I think there's sort of a Pareto rule going with change management. Uh, a lot of change managers are people, you know, who ended up there because they didn't know how to deliver things. I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, being, mm. I'm being rough here, but of course. Um, but the, but on the other hand, I've known people who brand themselves as change managers, where one con one thirty minute conversation with this person can save me three weeks of work, mm. or can provide the true key to unlocking adoption. So yes, change management is critical, but you've got to get the right change management to have that impact. So now let's just say we we talked about companies implementing AI and some of the challenges and why the reasons why they are doing it. In this uh, transformation that is happening, how important is setting up an ethical framework, a policy framework in a uh, in that kind of a company? Well, I th I think there's there's three ways that that it's important, uh, and they're all uh, actually they're all mission critical in different ways. Uh, first, there's license to operate. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be an increasing number of places where you must do this, or you are mm -hmm. not going to be allowed mm -hmm. uh, to work. The EU AI Act being you know one mm -hmm. great example of that. Sure. So uh, it's kind of binary. Mm -hmm. You have to do it. You have mm -hmm. to do it. Um, the second reason is that um, you know, is is the risk mitigation angle. If you are looking at these frameworks, the, the, one of the most important things you can get out of it is to establish in your organization patterns of accountability. And, and, and all, of the, all of the competing frameworks have this. Uh, so there's no, there's no one that, that mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, but the idea is if an AI is making decisions on behalf of the company, there has to be a human being that owns that decision. Do they under, yeah, does that person know that they own the decision? Do they understand the gravity and are they properly plugged in so that they can review and do the QA to be comfortable with the decisions that AI is making essentially on their behalf? Mm -hmm. So that's number two, is, 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 is establishing the patterns of accountability. The third is that it's going to unlock new business. There, there, there's actually, by doing it and by crafting it in a way that makes people comfortable, mm -hmm. that's going to be a competitive advantage because I mm -hmm. guarantee not everybody's going to be doing that. Right. So, um, Ariel, we talked about how you know, organizations are changing. Uh, there are things that need to change. Do you, some organizations are hiring chief AI officers. Uh, you know, there is a CIO, there's a CTO, there is a CSO. Now there's a CIO. Do you believe that there is a need for someone who really can make sure to take, because from what organizations tell me, this is not a pure technical job because this involves compliance, governance, change management, strategy. They say a large component is strategy. What is your thought on this? So <clears throat> I think there needs to be, in every case, that having a chief AI officer is the right model. Um, so I, what I'd rather do is talk about the criteria for this mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. One is, again, and, and, and to your point, somebody who understands the ecosystem that AI feeds. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to have a tech expert to rely on. This isn't that person. Mm -hmm. Okay, It needs to be somebody with the right people relationships and the right level of influence. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece, the second factor here is the governance. This mm -hmm. is somebody with a direct report to the board that mm -hmm. does not go through line management, or you will lose that risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and the third is... The person needs to be credible. You know, um, you know uh, I always had a problem with the, the, the term ESG, not because the, the you know, environment and social governance aren't important. They're critically important. They're, they're a large part of what we do. But you know, think about environment, social governance. What do they have in common? Almost nothing. The only thing they have in common is the perception, wrongly, mm -hmm. uh, by most uh, corporations, that they don't feed the bottom line. They say, well, we can get one high-profile person rather than hiring three, and we're going to save money. Mm -hmm. But this is the basic ESG is regarded the bucket of things that don't actually contribute to our business. Sure. Um, so it needs to be, you know, whether it's a, call them a chief AI officer or you make it the part of the portfolio of somebody else who already has a C-level title, it needs to be somebody who is regarded as by the rest, by the, by the management and by the board as part, you know, a serious contributor to the bottom line. It cannot be like head of ASG or head of diversity or head of, you know, it mm -hmm. needs to be a line position. Final question for you. You do also work in quantum computing. Why is quantum for our audience just briefly so important for AI? Uh, I think there's, there's three reasons again. Mm -hmm. um, 
The first is that it allows a broader portion of AI problems to be solved, particularly when it comes to uh, machine learning, because AI, or, you know, uh, or many AI under, you know, models, you know, all the way from you know basics like logistic regression down to some of the you know so some of the more advanced uh, you know deep learning techniques they all do better when you have a broader um training set mm -hmm. and quantum can exponentiate your training set it can exponentiate the data mm -hmm. that you can reflect on and introspect on uh in a reasonable amount of processing window mm -hmm. so that's number one number two is related is data simulation um Quantum can understand and map data relationships so that you can actually build a training set with a much smaller um, uh, you know, initial input of real world data, which is, you know, if, if you ask any startup, it's getting that training set that's the mm -hmm. key. So quantum can basically uh, completely change the equation by which you can simulate training sets and have some hope of, of, of real world uh, you know, uh, predictive accuracy. Um, and the third one is, you know, is on the other side with security, which is actually the talk that I'm giving today, this afternoon at Leap, is around quantum resilience. You know, when quantum computing becomes commercially available, it will cause, uh, make it trivial for a hacker, a competitor, a disgruntled employee to read internal emails, uh, illegally listen in on private messages or, or tap into private Zoom calls, steal passwords. All of these things become very, very simple. Um, so you have to, you, you know, you have to reflect that and make sure that you're using new and approved quantum resilient methods to lock down your AI training data. Well, so quantum really can help, but also hurt in many ways. Absolutely. What we are doing with AI, I think that's a very important point. Ariel, thanks so much for informing me and our listeners about what companies need to do in terms of change, in terms of the moving towards an AI-enabled uh, workforce, the uh, kind of roles that they need to have and why quantum is so important. Thanks for being on the podcast. You're very welcome. Can I give one plug? Yes, please. Okay. So what we've done in the area of quantum resilience is actually develop uh, a methodology that we were using, we are using with our clients. Our clients include Google, they include CMS, they include you know, mm -hmm. uh, many large firms, uh, even though we are tiny ourselves. We've developed a methodology that will help companies plan their roadmap to, to quantum resilience within their existing IT budget and process. You don't have to completely change your operating model to achieve quantum resilience over a period of four to six years, which is the best estimate about when QDA is going to happen. Um, we're sharing that methodology here for free at Leap. We're happy to share it with anybody uh, who's a subscriber of your podcast. We'll get on a call and we will talk them through it. Well, here you have it, listeners, a free roadmap of a free plan that has been offered by Ariel. So thanks so much for doing that and look forward to maybe having you back again. Thanks so much. I'd be delighted. Thanks much, Sunday. Thank you.